Okay. Welcome back to another episode of Stu, the Stu Crew. That's <laughs> Technology and Energy Women. Um, today, it's myself and Dr. Jackie Cretion. Um, uh, I'm Kat McGee, uh, representative from Hillsborough 27. And we're back to talk to you about some of the bills that went through our committee this session in case you have any interest of uh, how we did. So um, I'm just going to give a brief overview. We had 31 bills come to our committee. Um, and we had seven bills that are actually coming up. Two of them already went through, but five will be on the floor this coming week for a vote. Um, so those are ought to pass or ought to pass with amendment. And we'll get into some of those. And then we retained 15 bills. And that's really a big takeaway from, um, from what happened with the, the bills that we were supposed to review this year. There was really a, a rush, a push to... Um, move committees through their work as quickly as possible. And so we didn't get to listen to a lot of these bills. And so uh, many of them were just summarily retained, good, bad, or indifferent. They were just pushed over uh, for us to work on later in the year after the session's over. So in the fall, they'll come back again. And then we had nine bills that were considered inexpedient to legislate. And some of those were were very good bills in, in my opinion, but um, inexpedient to legislate basically means we shouldn't spend any more time on them. And so they are killed for this year. So 31 bills, um, 24 of them were either retained or ITL'd. So I think we're going to start off with talking about some of the ought to pass pieces. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the only thing I was going to throw in was that uh, hopefully in a, in a future episode we can visit some of these bills that, that were retained and explain why it's so unfortunate that we are kicking the can further down the road. Um, I hate that metaphor, but, <laughs> but, uh, but doing that with some of these things, um, especially study, study bills where um, all, all they would have done was set up a framework to, to study things anyway. Um, but yeah, so, so there's two bills um, in particular, I think that we really wanted to talk today about uh, that are going through as, as OTP and that we're, we're hoping or wishing would not uh, be passed. Um, so one that I'll mention right here, um, and apologies for the, the kid noises in the background life, um, is uh, HB 373, um, which basically it's a, it's a very short bill. It's only uh, a sentence maybe long, um, but basically is prohibiting our Department of Environmental Services from talking to uh, anybody in surrounding states about anything to do uh, with low carbon planning or um, yeah, plots for, for going ahead. So um, it, it's kind of a ridiculous, we're referring to it as, as the gag rule bill. Um, it just seems really absurd to me to be holding back uh, our professional, um, you know, folks who, who work on this every day in DES um, can't talk to their colleagues in other states and are really trying to handicap uh, New Hampshire from doing any sort of planning or, or knowing what's going on um, around us to, to be able to advocate for, for what we need to be doing on carbon planning. That's what we pay them for. Uh, we, we actually pay those state employees right. in the <laughs> division to right. know what's going on and to advise us what's going on. So yeah. um, but I think the interesting trailer on that particular bill, though, is that in the hearings, the person who spoke on behalf of it, and I asked him if he wrote the bill, and he did, <laughs> Greg Moore from Americans for Prosperity. So the bill didn't come from inside New Hampshire. And I think that's another thing that we suffer from on our committee and on a lot of committees is the fact that there's an outside agenda, an outside New Hampshire agenda coming into our hearing rooms and coming into our bills that we're hearing. And it's not stuff we're looking to to do. And, and in fact, the things that we're trying to get done is what is getting shelved <laughs> on behalf of the people of New Hampshire. And he explained that what he was trying to do, just by way of a little more explanation, the Transportation Climate Initiative was put together as a regional initiative to attack the emissions in the transportation sector, which is the next sector that we want to move on toward because we've made great gains in lowering our emissions in the electric generation sector. So when you're looking at our portfolio and where the emissions are, 
it makes sense for us to be um, working on policies that lower that next sector, the, the emissions from the transmission sector. So we had another bill that was on bringing low emission and zero emission vehicles into the state so that we could start having people buy more efficient vehicles and see them and be able to test drive them and all that. And this is the second time that that bill was killed. So everything that we try to do on the transmission sector emissions um, is being fought by industry. Um, and in the last uh, session, when we had the majority, we passed the Levs and Zevs bill, the low emission, zero emission vehicle bill, and it was vetoed. So we have um, folks with a different agenda than trying to actually solve the problems, which is what we've been trying to do. So that's the way I look at the that gag rule bill is that it was not a bill that anyone who's working to benefit the energy sector in New Hampshire um, was behind. Yeah, absolutely. Plus it's, you know, just an overreach to, to tell, in my opinion, to tell a, a, you know, department who they can and can't talk to or what topics are or aren't permissible. Like that, like you said, that's their job. That's what they should be figuring out on our behalf. We shouldn't be micromanaging them uh, to that level. And, and the governor already made the decision that we weren't going to participate in TCI. So there wasn't really any threat of anybody going to do that work. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, like, but we, we should know what we, is, yeah. <laughs> we, we should know what everyone else is doing. And uh, yeah. That would be nice. Yeah. All right. Do you so, want to talk about 351? Oh my gosh, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is an interesting one. Um, there's a lot of interesting ones, actually, but um, uh, House Bill 351 is uh, on the surface is simply saying that the approval for um, the system benefits charge rate, which is currently set by our rate setting authority over at the Public Utilities Commission, uh, should come back to the house for approval. So we should get to approve the approvers. We gave them the authority, but now we're saying that's not good enough. We want to have authority over that authority. Um, and, you know, my argument, I did the minority report and my argument was basically, we don't have any expertise over here about what that rate should be. They actually, all they do is go through proceedings to try and figure out how to set those rates properly. And so um, bringing it back to the house is what is politicizing it. It's not political because it's at the PUC. It's political when it comes back to the political, you know, the, po the politics of the house. But anyway, so it, the bill did that, but then it went on to also stop uh, an existing public utilities commission docket on establishing how the funding is going to go into the plan for New Hampshire saves. So our utilities uh, do energy efficiency through the New Hampshire Saves program. And there's been a docket over there for months and months, probably about a year. And they just got to a settlement with the utilities about how much money was going to go into those programs. And uh, it's been stalled. And this bill will put the nail in the coffin for it. So it's a pretty bad bill because um, we have a difference of opinion with our GOP colleagues as to whether energy efficiency is something we should do. And, um, and the work that they did on the docket for the three-year energy plan uh, proves that it will be a $1.3 billion boost to the economy. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's a, it's an excellent investment. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about energy efficiency? Important not to waste energy, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so is that it on 351? Yeah. Oh, so that's actually one of our ought to pass bills. And I will be speaking on the floor on that and hoping, you know, asking folks if we can overturn the OTP to consider a different motion and maybe ITL it because we don't want to uh, prevent funding for New Hampshire states in the next three years. We would like that to go forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do we want to talk at all about 315? Um, so this is a bill that started off as being very skewed um, in favor of monopoly power companies versus allowing communities to create their own, but 
through through some work, um, I think it's a good demonstration that that when we have the opportunity to to work together and hammer things out, we actually can occasionally come up with something bipartisan. Um, you probably you know more of the details of that process than me. Do you want to talk about that at all? Or? I was in I was involved early on because because the community power community was upset that the bill um, had been written by Eversource. We, we had testimony that it was the utilities, but when we actually, you know, pushed a little deeper, it was like, it was just one company that was um, writing the rules in a way that disadvantaged smaller um, generators uh, coming into the market. And it affected um, RSA 53E, which had only just gone into law. The governor had signed it in 2019. So people were just starting to get used to the rules as they were. And this was a rewriting of those rules that was skewed, like you said, just toward um, utilities and not towards the community power aggregators. So, um, so what ended up happening is that community stepped forward and said, this is unacceptable and we need to talk about the details here and what needs to be in here in order to improve what you say you're improving, but not just to one side's advantage. That's all it was. So because we had really knowledgeable people who could actually articulate what was wrong and not all of us can do that. Um, they were able to step forward and put together a stakeholder process that included the utilities and the leadership on our committee and they got us to yes. So they got us to a bill that we could, we could all vote for. But that was the only example of that this session. Yeah, I think it, it is a good maybe demonstration of, I mean, I don't know how many emails I got about this bill, but there was huge pushback from, from the folks who were involved um, and, and planning these community power things. And it was, it was clear that there was a lot of, of upset um folks and so yes please <laughs> please do email and, and call your reps um if there's things that are going on that you're concerned about because it does make a difference uh sometimes <laughs> yeah i think it got them to the table in the in the case of that particular bill that was hb 315. um yeah so um there is an otpa uh, auto pass as amended of HB 614 FN and HB 614 um, undermines renewable portfolio standard payments that are known as alternative compliance payments, which means if you don't meet the requirement for the percentage of the energy that you use that is from renewable sources, then you have to pay into the system and that money gets used for us to invest in other renewables. So projects that are going on around the state are funded through this RPS standard. And uh, I'm sure that alternative compliance payments are an annoyance to the utilities and maybe others, but what this bill does is it says that municipalities uh, who don't wanna pay the alternative compliance payment um, have the option. <laughs> Yeah, just just ignore it. Yeah. So actually, my yeah. understanding of it and what I think makes it even worse is that it automatically opts municipalities out. So it says you don't have to pay this anymore. And if you change your mind and you decide that you want to, then you can jump back in. Um, but in the meantime, you you lose your ability to qualify for these various uh, funds that come from from that program. And so I think that could be a big mess just well, um, I, I know, you know, maybe in terms of them. But I think that it, I think that what it does is um, it my understanding was that it allows municipalities to still take funds out of the RPS if they have a project, even though they're not paying in. And what it, so what it does is it just defunds the program. It, it, right. So over time, people are going to say, well, if I don't have to pay this anymore, uh, we'll opt, we'll 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 opt to not pay it. But the amendment that was put on it, I read in the committee because I'm like, if people don't understand what they're voting for, this is what they're voting for. The yeah. amendment made it even worse because the amendment said, right. if my town decides they no longer want to pay the alternative compliance payment on the electric bill, they opt out uh, of that, then then the utility no longer has to pay it. 
And then below that, it said, and if the town contracts with an, a, a, you know, somebody who is not a utility, right? Somebody who's not a default service provider, but who's some other type of energy provider, they have to lower their rates to exclude the alternative compliance payments. So basically it's saying all the way down the line, we are breaking <laughs> we are defunding. funding for renewables. And so it's a very, very dangerous bill. And it went from our committee over to Ways and Means because it had an FN on it, which meant that it had an A, I think too, but it had uh, an impact on local uh budgets. <laughs> and so uh, I'm not sure they were able to determine what it would be because they have no idea, um, you know, how it's going to play out. But they did a bunch of research. I testified there and uh, so did Lee Oxenham from our committee and because they didn't know a lot about it. And I am not sure that they are going to recommend it, but it's going to be a hard one to fight on the floor. And we need to probably do some more work to figure out what we're going to say when that bill comes up. Um, all right. Well, do you, do you want to leave it there? Or do you want to talk about any of the, the ITLs that, uh, yeah, that's a lot of stuff for one episode. We, yeah. you know, we might not even be able to, <laughs> I don't know how it's going to get edited together. Yeah. There will be no outro for this episode. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, I'm good. I, I just want to thank anybody who bothered to listen to us talk about what went on with some of our ought to pass bills, uh, for this session. And it's, uh, yeah. it's not too late. Contact your your reps and ask them to yeah. not vote for uh, gagging or DES and uh, defunding our RPS and <laughs> defunding our RPS and uh, making the systems charge uh, political again uh, when it doesn't need to be. <laughs> yeah. and, and please help them not un defund our energy efficiency program with New Hampshire saves because a lot of people rely on that. Yeah. All right. See you next time. Bye. What do you think about energy efficiency? Important not to waste energy, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent advice. Can you say that louder? I don't know if we heard it. You could probably use windmills and water solar panels. Water solar panels. What's James's advice? He says you should probably just use windmills and waterfalls and solar panels. So. <laughs> well, well, water wheels, like, they, like, water can give energy because it's you put like the water wheel in water, <laughs> it will spin and then it will give energy. Yeah. And that's better than burning yeah. gas and coal, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Can I, can I come back to you later? Okay. <laughs>